down to the final two weeks of the year. A lot of shenanigans going on in the market. Got a student loan you don't want to pay? Don't worry about it. Don't pay it. Don't pay it. We got issues in the Middle East with the gas supply impacting prices, all that stuff. A ton of data this week, ton of Fed presidents speaking. We're going to be going through all of that and more today on Money Never Sleeps. Appreciate you joining us today, everybody. Before we get going, do us a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Nothing that Kevin or I say is financial advice, so please do your own research before making any sort of buys or sells. Kev, set two weeks left in the year. Things are feeling bullish out there. The markets are in the green today. We see TradFi pumping, being led by tech. A lot of, uh, a lot of big numbers I'm seeing. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh. Oh, terrible. A lot of big numbers I'm seeing on the screens here. You know, the the magnificent seven or eight or whatever, however fucking many it is, uh, having a good day overall. Nvidia's up over two and a half percent. Netflix up almost three and a half percent. Meta up over three percent. It is uh, sunshine and rainbows in the markets as we close out the year. How are you feeling about things today? Uh, very numb. It just seems like with nine days left in the trading year. There's not going to be too much, uh, too, not too much fuckery, you know, things going either way. In my opinion, it's going to be really interesting. I think once we get out of this, this is just kind of like the lull of, yeah, this is the trend. It's, it's to the upside for the time being, but there's definitely a lot of news behind the scenes that people aren't just paying attention to or just like, oh, no, 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 we'll worry about that next year or we'll just uh, worry about that at a different time. It's not affecting our little Santa rally that we're having right here. So is the market logical right now? 100%. But uh, Blue Logic, you know, come to bite everyone in the ass one day. Uh, it seems like it's going to, regardless of what we want. So, just getting through the end of the year, man. That's all that's important to me. All right, let's quickly look at the data coming out this week. Nothing really meaningful today. Tomorrow we have some housing data as well as a couple of Fed presidents speaking. Wednesday, existing home sales interested as a you know hopefully home buyer in the next couple of years. I am. You know, keeping my eyes on the real estate market and looking for opportunities there. Thursdays, we get initial jobless claims as well as a GDP revision to see how Q3 looked. I believe it's our final uh, number for Q3 GDP. And then on Friday, we get a ton of data. We got personal income, personal spending, PCE, core PCE. The last like big, big day of data in the year. So that is going to be really interesting to watch how that hits the markets heading into uh, the the Christmas weekend. Obviously, Christmas next Monday. So the 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 markets will digest everything for a day. If it is good, don't I wouldn't be shocked if we see like a blow off top kind of a day for the equities to really kick that Santa rally into full gear. So that's what we're looking forward to this week. Let's start with uh, oil prices. And how we've seen a pump there today on the news that a lot of suppliers are either cutting back on their supply or having to change shipping routes due to unrest in the Middle East and concern over losing supply attacks, things like that. So on the day, I'm pulling up oil right now. We have seen a uh, a one and a half percent gain in Brent crude and WTI. So in the U.S. and in Europe, prices of oil are going up. They, they bounced off of some lows last Tuesday around 68, 61 a barrel for WTI. And Brent crude got down to as low as 73. So they've they've made a bit of a recovery here, starting to trend back up heading into end of the year. What are you seeing in the charts and how are you? Are you is there anything on your end that you're actively doing with oil or are you just kind of an observer at this point? Oh yeah, for oil, I'm not even not even touching any commodities because I think this is going to go a lot lower. It's just in the short term, things can things like this that uh, in the news can definitely impact the price of oil. It could have went either way, to be honest with you. But I think that the thing that we need to see is that a lot of CTAs and uh, hedge funds are actually shorting oil heavily right now. So, given the news that we saw, 
you know, realistically and logically, this makes sense that the oil price would go up because there is complications of, you know, getting it around that, uh, that route. We also know that Russia also is cutting oil and that route which is currently having issues is the way that Russia gets oil to, uh, to China. So it's complicating a lot of things. However, if we look back at October, which, you know, October, a lot of things happened. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what changed in the system for the fed, but in October, you know, we got a pretty good little pump there. And that was from the Israel Hamas uh, conflict that was going on. It was still going on, but we saw that it pumped. And then slowly after, you know, something that probably should have impacted the prices a lot more, kind of didn't we saw the demand kind of you know set in and it kept dropping i think right now what we're seeing is a bit of an artificial pump you know we're squeezing a bit of the shorts because you know if we look at where oil is currently from where it was a few days ago it's up uh it wicked all the way up to about 10 percent up from where currently where it was prior so it's a little good move there we were expecting a bit of a bounce nothing can go down forever but at the same time we can see how the stick has to RSI on the daily for u.s oil is you know getting pretty close to overbought fairly quickly. It does tell me that maybe we do consolidate a little bit here for a few days before we start to see a tail off, retest this level down here at 67.96, which is this white line. Um, we can see that it's been held to support in the past, back in May, back in March. Eventually this is probably gonna go through and that would probably give us, you know, more complications on the, on the commodities front. Uh, it, kind of just shows you that, okay, regardless of whatever happens in the world, there's a good chance that demand could uh, supersede any of those impacts. Okay. Let's talk about student loan payments for a second here. Piece of news came out, saw the story from Politico, a few different accounts on Twitter, that for the month of October, about 40% of people with student loan payments just didn't make them. Just decided, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. Now, we also know that the government has said that they will not report people to the credit bureaus through the end of September of next year. That being said, I don't think most people know that when they decided uh, or when they made the choice to not make their payments. I think it was more of a necessity of not budgeting for it, not being prepared for that extra expense. And now they get to, you know, they get to roll that over. They have more debt. That debt is compounding at a higher rate now. Like, it's it's no bueno man like no matter how you slice it like this may not seem like a big deal and it's not like the end of the world but it is just another crack in the foundation of why you know 2024 may not be the uh, amazing year that a lot of people are betting it will be yeah i mean what will november december bring for people who didn't pay their loans too right i'm really interested in seeing how those numbers come out as well because if they didn't pay it in october and they know that they have maybe until September to start seeing any of that kind of impact their credit if they ever find that out. Um, there's a good chance that this can continue to pile up and this is more debt and this causes more issues, not just for, you know, these uh, lenders, but it also causes a lot more issues for just anyone who has exposure to this. I mean, this is pretty, it's pretty catastrophic for these banks too, right? Anyone who wants any money to these kids and they're not getting it. Imagine if we get into a liquidity crisis come next year and some of these banks that were, you know, I mean, take for example, a SoFi, right? SoFi, sure, they they deal heavily in student loans and, you know, loans like that, not necessarily, um, you know, home loans, but for student loans, they're one of the bigger lenders for, and that a lot of kids go through. So we know that they're having a lot of issues. They were fighting with the government for a while saying that, hey, we kind of need you to, you know, get rid of this little uh, grace period. We start need to start making some money. So we will talk about the banks in a second, but this is definitely going to impact everything across the board. And I think this is going to start to shift into a liquidity crisis regardless, because debt can only pile up so long before you have, it has to be paid off at some point. And, you know, I'm not bullish on any, you know, for 40% of the people that didn't pay, that's, you know, eight point something million people that didn't pay. I'm not bullish on them paying in November or December. Uh, that's just my opinion. Not. But I'm not, not at all. Um, but the good thing is, you know, if you are, of the belief that you shouldn't be paying for someone's uh, education, the taxpayers, they're probably not going to get a job next year uh, or they probably won't be able to find the job. So <laughs> with that being said, they're probably going to see unemployment rise. So if that makes you feel any better, uh, good for you in some weird way. But yeah, this is not going to be good for anyone moving forward. And if they don't have a job, how the hell are they going to pay this shit, right? Uh, initial claims are going to be really important to keep see that because that also indicates if we're going to start seeing unemployment rise, which 
if the holiday season also, I know I'm going on a tangent, but if the holiday season isn't great this year, they start laying people off. These kids are not going to have, you know, the funds to pay any of these uh, bills off. So it's kind of a domino effect leading into next year. This is kind of uh this is just adding shit on top of the pile. And we're just at the beginning when it comes to the job market, we're just at the very beginning of AI replacing people. Like that's one thing that's interesting talking to friends who are in different industries of, you know, how is AI impacting your job and the people in your job? And do you see, you know, possibilities of like it, it removing, you know, some available jobs and they're all like, yeah, absolutely. And so that is something to be mindful of for the future as well. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get into, you'd brought up the banks. We want to discuss some reverse repo stuff. Let's hit that. And then let's hit the charts before we get out of here today. Definitely. We also need to take a look at small caps after we look at the banks because it's kind of ties in with what's going on in the market right now. But for the time being, let's pull up some of the banks. Uh, we'll see across the board how they're faring today. Uh, News flash is not necessarily the greatest. We can see that everything is pretty red on the side on my right hand side. I mean, it, they've had a great October, right? Something clearly happened in October. And I keep alluding to this because that was the exact moment in which the uh, the bear, the bull steepener absolutely reverted. And we saw an initial jobless claims kind of go down. So something kind of spooked the Fed that happened in October. And that's when the banks started going up like crazy. Um, you know, obviously we've seen, this is just Bank of America, but looking from where it was in October to where it currently is, it's up 34%. <laughs> I mean, Charles Schwab, you know, one of the banks that is probably – most at risk, in my opinion, from seeing how much they borrow for the bank term funding program, how much that's operating as a percentage or FHLB is operating as percentage of their uh, operating equity. It's an absurd number. It's probably next in line after Silicon Valley and First Republic. Well, they're up 41%. Now, the question is, why are these banks doing so well? Well, we should take a look at what's going on in the reverse repo market. And this is a really scary chart because as of recent and specifically in October, which is right around here, you can see that it went from 1.56 trillion down to as of Friday's close, 683.254 billion. It's absolutely just dropped off a cliff since October. Let's go from here to where it is. It's down roughly 56%, which means that these banks are just siphoning this 100% for liquidity purposes, right? Now let's go over to the bank term funding program that ends March 11th of next year. Let's take a look at how that's doing. Um, well, let's, for, let's not forget what this is. Everyone thought this was QE. No, this was 100% a loan that the Fed borrowed all these banks to pull from, and then they would have to pay it back at, and it would cut into their profits. That was pretty much the idea of it. it wasn't QE. It was still, uh, it was still just pretty much a loan at that point. But here we are, you know, you would think that they would have started to tail off at this point as they started paying it off, but very similar to like the college kids that don't want to pay their fucking bills. The banks are at 123 billion of the bank term funding program, almost 124 billion. If this continues to go up into March and they don't pay any of this off, then what the hell is going to happen? Are they going to close down the bank term funding program? Are we going to start seeing some of these smaller banks that have exposure, uh, you know, to this bank term funding program, which obviously means that they're in trouble because they had to borrow for liquidity. Are they going to start going under? I think there's a very good case to start saying that the regional banks are going to start seeing a lot of problems come around late February, early March, when this starts to expire, if they're not able to make uh, their payments. You know, I'm not necessarily convinced that it's going to impact all the banks. I think it, I mean, it will impact all the banks, but it's not going to put out a ton of banks. I think there's a good chance that we start to see throughout the entire summer, a lot of these smaller regional banks uh, becoming insolvent, maybe some of the bigger banks also taking on some of that risk. But does that at some point start to bleed up? where now we start to see a lot of the contagion hits, you know, the Charles Schwab's, the PNC's. I mean, if you just look at this list of banks that I have here on the right hand side, you know, Bank of America, uh, Citibank, you know, they're all these banks are putting in these really good rallies. I don't know if this is necessarily the Fed trying to help them out here, you know, saying like, all right, sell whatever uh, assets you have on hand and hopefully you can pay, pay us back. Otherwise we're going to, you know, you guys might be screwed or we're going to have to see if we can organize someone to buy you out. But there's a lot of banks on here that, 100% I borrowed from this uh, FHLB and BTFP. They don't pay that back, Ben. I think that we could be seeing what happened back in March of 2023. However, I don't necessarily know if it'll be uh, if these banks are too small to fail because I think there's a good chance there's a lot of them that could fail. Um, maybe not all at one time, but definitely between March and say September of next year, it could be a summer of just bank failures. So we need to keep an eye on that. That's not necessarily saying that it's going to happen, a, but it's not a fun summer. Oh, not at all. But I mean, what is this? This is all comes back to debt. How much did they loan out? How much is being repaid? Hot 
Earl summer to bank failure summer. I feel like that's just a terrible trade off. I'm okay with the banks failing, man. I, there's a lot of them that are just bad actors in this space. And if if there's any position that I'm happy, I'm short. It's the banks at this point. I, I hate people lose money, but these fuckers have been bailed out time after time. The BTFP, pissed, they will 100. But hopefully, there's a few Washington mutuals in there. Uh, if anyone remembers how that played out, but. Besides that, that's what I'm seeing. There, I think the banking crisis is going to come back, and it usually does come back in multiple parts. If we look at Lehman Brothers, that happened, you know, months after Bear Stearns collapse, and then after that, we started to see the fallout of everything. So I think that there is a time period where they kind of got saved, they kind of got, um, you know, cushioned, and once that cushion gets pulled away, then watch out. I think we're going to be in a world of pain for those. Now, let's move on to equities real quick because we can see that everything's up, right? Twenty-seven up for the S and P. NASDAQ, once again, up 133 points there. The Dow, only up 22, 23 points. Looks like it's finding some resistance on that uh, upper parallel channel. Will that last? I don't know, man. This market seems like it just wants to buy fucking everything. Even shit that's not for sale it wants to buy. But the important thing to look here is the small caps, and that is the Russell. And it's only up 0.1% today. And why is this important? Well, if we really are in a bull market and everyone's saying that, you know, we're going to start going up a lot further, then why aren't the small caps moving with the big boys, right? You'd think that they would be lifting them up. Unfortunately, no. We're here at a quad top once again. I can see that the Russell is having so much trouble breaking this like 2000, 2010, 2015 like range. It's, it's like, it's, here, I'll draw a rectangle so everyone can see it. But it's a really tight range that it continues to, you know, get rejected from. As soon as we get into this, I think we see a lot of selling. We saw a lot of selling recently. Now, the question is when we look at the stochastic RSI, as we see how much it's coiled up since you know October, you know November first all the way to October, we're at ninety seven and ninety nine, and we're only at nineteen eighty seven. We're not even in the two thousands. Is there a chance that this thing absolutely just tumbles after this? Because you can only get rejected so long. Same thing with finding support. You can only find support for so long before it starts to break through. Um, I think that we could be in a consolidation kind of sideways chain, uh, moving this way, trading sideways, and. If, uh, you know, in some odd way, we put in a little bit of a, a higher high here, I mean, it could be just an ABC pattern. It really could. Um, and that could just lead us into next year. Um, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but I think that there is a good chance. I mean, this could even be lower. I think my target was a lot lower. Yeah, it was. But um, I think that what we're seeing here is very much consolidation. And I could even be an asshole and say it's a triangle at this point. And we need to see, you know, how long, I don't know how I can draw this probably be a triangle like this yeah it'd be something more like that you're uh, but um in a hundred points of the nasdaq putting in an all-time high right now which is pretty oh, wonderful to see it 100 is and that's the that's the big divergence between small caps and these big ones everyone's november, very excited so i'm looking at right now november 22nd of 2021 we saw the nasdaq wick up to 1676 and yep. we're at 16 70 actually we're we're very holy shit we're uh it's yeah, gonna happen 10 points away so we're yeah it's, it's a new all-time high is incoming we've already seen the all-time high for the dow hit uh i believe got one more we saw that yeah, yeah man dow hit the all-time high crazy. and the s&p is the only one that's not there yet and it probably will let's be honest right i think the s&p will probably get to it it's got to go to like 48, 48 20 15 or something probably. 20 yes something around there and it's it's very possible right um yeah. piece uh, pc Great. data comes back cool people are like oh fucking inflation's coming down faster than we expected that's awesome that means they're gonna you know do qe and it's like hey go ahead enjoy your little rally it's not what it means but yeah i mean we're hitting all-time highs in these indexes that's not necessarily a great thing if you are in the russell and you can't break resistance at this point Right. That's that tells me that there is divergence between the large caps and the small caps. And it also tells me that this is a larger bubble than maybe we're anticipating because the real uh, economy is 100 percent. The Russell, that's the one we, we follow to see how things are actually doing. Um, this is 100 percent all the inflated shit that we truly believe is going to change the world. And don't get me wrong. I'm not going to talk shit about all these companies, but someone posted something really smart the other day. And I, I've been saying it. I, I haven't said it in a while, but I said it a long time ago. It's. Ever since COVID, what did any of these companies do that makes them this valuable? I can't tell you one thing that Apple has made that has really changed the world, you know, in some spectacular way or what Meta has done since Metaverse, I guess, maybe. I don't know. I've, I've never even fucking seen what Facebook's Meta looks like. The only one that I could arguably say did anything revolutionary is NVIDIA. 
And I'm not even convinced that NVIDIA 100% is telling us the why, whole story. You know, why do you always do this? Like, you always got to piss on my parade. You know, I'm sitting here <laughs> reveling in the sight of NVIDIA being up almost 3% today. I'm trying to close out the year feeling good. And you just want to come in day after day after day and be honest with me instead of like blowing smoke up my ass. And it's pissing me off, Kevin. I told, I said that NVIDIA was the only one that kind of did anything that's going to be really important in the future. So that's that's my little disclaimer. But, yeah, but then thing you followed is, it with a punt, and that just negates everything you say before that. Because I don't trust any of these companies. I don't trust anything that they're fucking spewing. And again, they're talking about beating earnings this entire year. Let's look at corporate profits year over year to see how they're performing. NVIDIA is probably the only one that's doing better than they were the year prior. I know Tesla's not doing fucking better than they were doing in 2022, 2021. Not at all. And, you know, we're just bullshitting ourselves when we think that, the oh, they're more, earnings. The more I see about the Cybertruck, the more bearish I get on Tesla. Like, it is just, it's a hot mess, that thing. Like, just overall. Oh, yeah. so, oh boy. Never buy the first model of those, of anything Tesla. They are always riddled with problems every single time. So that's, and again, if we pull up Tesla right here, it looks like Tesla wants to break to the upside. It really does. I'm not going to lie to anyone. The weekly, it looks like it's getting pretty close to overbought. However, I don't buy this going into next year because once we start getting those Q4 earnings, I think we're going to find out how badly pressed a lot of consumers are. And that's not going to be good for any of these companies, right? I don't genuinely believe anyone's buying their wife a, tes uh, a Tesla right now for, for Christmas or Hanukkah, whatever it is. Uh, Cybertruck, yeah, you got some people that are really excited to buy it. Those people had Cybertruck money on hand. Other people, I don't necessarily think they have the money. I think they probably got their hundred dollar deposit back if they uh, if they did put it down back into the top of the bull market in 2021, because that's literally when it came out. Came out, I'm pretty sure, or maybe maybe a few years earlier. I think it was Can't a remember. few years earlier than that. It might have been like 2019 or 2020, something like that. But uh, yeah. this is a uh, this is what I'm seeing. I think that on the technical, yeah, it probably should shoot up. You know, it could go up to 300. I think that's very possible. I just don't buy it. I don't buy it one bit. And it's the same thing if I look at the Chinese stock market. Yeah, looks bullish technically. I don't fucking buy it though. One, not once, not one bit. If we look at this on the HSI, this is a bull flag. This thing should break up. Do I know that the state of the economy in China is very uh, complex? 100%. I'm not bullish on the stock, the HSI or the Shanghai, Shanghai Composite, I believe it is. Neither of those are speaking to me despite what the technicals are saying. So I think we are going to diverge a bit from the technicals moving forward. Let's get away from TradFi and which we look at. We should take a look at some of the altcoins that are looking like shit. Yeah, let's just quickly go through a couple of those. If you want to hit Bitcoin real quick and then we can yeah. in touch on a few of the alts. Absolutely. So we did talk a few days ago, right before you went on your trip, I believe, about Bitcoin possibly going to this 45, 46 level. Got as high as about 44.69. So fairly close. Again, that was just based off of how the positioning was in the market. Um, I haven't looked at the liquidations yet today, but I'm sure that there is still probably a lot of liquidations that from people who are shorting here. So the price could probably push up a little bit further if it really wanted to. I'll pull that up in a second. But for the most part, nothing has necessarily changed. We're still within this range, and I still think that this is our B wave. I think we are going to top fairly soon, though. And I, I say that because I think that we are going to get one little blow off top. And I'm not saying it's going to go to 50K, but I think it's going to go up just a little bit higher. People are going to start buying in. And then we're just going to look down below going into 2024, seeing that there's a lot of liquidity down here. And there's not necessarily a lot of things that we need to test, right? A, a lot of our support that we're going to re retest isn't necessarily here. It's going to be back here or it's going to be back here, right? So if I'm looking at this, you know, 34K is probably a good level that we're going to want to keep an eye on. Uh, if we lose that, then obviously 30,000 is going to be a level we're going to keep an eye on. If it loses that, 25 is the ultimate level that we have to see if it holds. If it doesn't hold 25, we are in a very, very scary place for Bitcoin because then, okay, we'll probably get a correction. But how short-lived is that going to be? Probably very short-lived. Um, I'm looking at the liquidation chart. Let me pull that up real quick for Bitcoin. And we could see that across the board, it is kind of in the middle. It's liquidated a lot of positions in both directions on the one day. Let's look at the seven day. Yeah, it looks like there is a bit of a move to the upside that can be had. Again, once again, I think it's around that 45 level. It's about $3.4 billion worth of shorts that could get liquidated. If we go back further, obviously, it's a lot less. I think it makes more sense to make people believe that the price is going up from here. And then build this liquidity. Then on the way down, you just kind of uh, kind of pull the rug and grab everything in one full, full swift. I don't know rug pull all the way down and see see us at 35, 30k. See if that holds. But we don't have a lot of support below us, despite what uh, people are telling you. And I'm not convinced that has changed Kevin, since the price. I just I, 
real quick, the saying is one fell swoop. Okay. Fell swoop. Did you Google that or do you just know that by I've memory? That. I didn't know. I didn't that. know that ever. Yeah. It's one. I, I used to think it was one and I know it because I used to think it was one foul swoop. And then I, someone correct me and I looked it up a while ago and it's one fell swoop. I don't, I like mine better. Uh, <laughs> I like mine better. <laughs> hey, you know what? Listen, I'm not trying to tell you, uh, you don't need to change anything for me. Okay. I was just kind of letting you know as a fun fact, a little fun fact here. I believe you. Yeah. I take your word before I believe any, any quant on Twitter at this point, if they were to say that to me, I'd be Twitter like, go fuck yourself. Twitter quants. I, I have a term for them. You got to follow me on Twitter to see what I call them because it's not a uh, PG for this show. So, you know, it's bad, uh, but let's look at ETH real quick. Still in this parallel channel, nothing too crazy here. Volumes are still extremely low. And here's the thing with these volumes. And I, I say it across the board. When we see volumes this low, 100%, that means that retail is transacting on the daily. That is them. 100% just trading, buying, selling, buying, selling. It's not any of the whales. So we had a pretty good move to the downside recently, and we can't deny that. Like, look at this. We had a really good wick down to 2114. We're up today. Uh, you know, we're down actually today, 25.7, but you know, it bounced off this level of support that's here back in November 9th. But it seems like we are testing back. Got to see how that 50 moving average holds. But um, you know, it, it seems like we're getting very toppy. Could we push up a little bit more to you know 24, 24 to 25? Yes, it's very possible that it can happen. But I think we're getting exhausted. And the thing that's showing me that we're getting exhausted is that we're starting to see these alts sell off. So if I look at this on Matic, what does that look like to you? Other than a pair of bosoms, that looks like a double top, right? <laughs> you know that saying? Yeah. All right. Let's just keep this going. Let's. We got to wrap this up. We got to wrap right. it up. But it's a, it's a double top, but it's a it's a lower high, so that's what we need to see. We're gonna see how this reacts. But Matic really bad, you know, five point eleven percent down, not necessarily a great sign when we're looking at the strength of alts. Let's look at uh, XRP. XRP once again a lower high. It's still within this triangle that we've kind of been charting for a long time. We're not gonna get too involved with it because we do know that this one hundred percent plays out regardless of whatever Bitcoin does. Now we did talk about Solana a few weeks back going to seventy five dollars. It looked like it wicked all the way up to about seventy nine, almost eighty dollars. Uh, it's right on par. We do know that FTX also hasn't liquidated a huge uh, holding of their Solana bag still. So that's something to keep in mind if that stays elevated here. I think that we're talking about a little MM market maker manipulation going on. Um, but we'll see how that plays out. And then last few ones we can take a look at. Link looks like it found a bit of rejection up there. We need to see if this puts in a lower high that could confirm that, you know, maybe alts have topped out. And we're not seeing the alt season that we were promised from your favorite influencer. This one, I mean, we're seeing it's it's funny. We're starting to see the tops kind of forming, or at least local tops form for a lot of these alts, but we're not seeing it in TradFi. Kind of shows you that we are seeing liquidity being pulled from the system. And if it does start to move faster, that's 100% uh, in a liquid market. Now I just want to look at total three, see how that's playing out. Yeah, it looks like it wicked all the way down to 433 billion. A few days ago, wicked down to 425. I think we are starting to see people get out of the market when we look at that. And if there's anything else that we need to take a look at, I think Cardano is another one because that one, yeah, perfect. Shot all the way up to 68 cents. Now we're 11 cents under that. And we wicked, you know, to 54, 55. And based off these wicks, you know, probably say that this is our current level of support. And if we lose, you know, anywhere between 58 and say 60 in the coming days, then there's a good chance that we're going to go to our next level of support which is either 46 cents or, you know, we could see 40 cent Cardano after that massive pump to the upside. So across the board, I think everything looks like crap in the alt market. I think Bitcoin and ETH are probably going to hold up a little bit better just from where we are. And also those are probably going to be the strong ones that are going to move more so if we do start to see these last bit of pumps. Other than that, nothing too crazy. We have the Bank of Japan doing their meeting tomorrow. If they decide to uh, do rate hikes, it's go either way. They do rate uh, do rate hikes, then obviously the dollar is going to tank. But it also means that there's going to be a lot of money leaving the United States, uh, both Treasury and stock market, as they go back to Japan, hoping to get you know higher yields. That's kind of the idea of what happens in that yen carry trade. Or if they don't, which I don't think is going to happen, I don't think they're going to rate uh, rates this time around because their inflation is kind of based off of what's happened with oil. I think there's a good chance we could see their CPI numbers kind of dip. 
the oil problem right now is definitely going to be very sticky for some of this uh, data that maybe comes out for the month of December, but we'll have to see it's towards the end of the month. So I don't necessarily think it will impact it too much, but that's where we stand on things that will impact markets going into tomorrow that no one else is talking about. All right. I love it. We're going to wrap it up for the day on that note. We'll be back tomorrow, keeping you updated on everything happening in the markets. Do us a favor if you have not yet, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment, share us out on social, all that good stuff. Appreciate everybody, as always. Stay safe in the markets. It's going to get wild out there, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone.